Good evening, all of you. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, a very distinguished speaker today and to the Graduate School of Business. I am Patrick Duparc. I am the Dean of the Graduate School of Business. Uh, Mr. Kelly Mbedov, as you no doubt all know, was the former governor of the National Bank of Kazakhstan and is now the governor of the Astana International Financial Center. If I may say so, one of the most ambitious projects that I've seen in Kazakhstan in many years and one that will have a significant impact on our economy for the better. When I was in, uh, asked to introduce Mr. Kelly Mbedov, it was given a short um, uh, introduction to his talk, I was very pleased to read a reference to one of my favorite uh, economic philosophers, Adam Smith. Adam Smith wrote almost 250 years ago in his uh, book, The Wealth of Nations, how a free market guided by many decision makers, both demand and supply, will act as if guided by an invisible hand and reach economic equilibrium. Now, many free market proponents, of course, assume that by setting everything free, this equilibrium will automatically uh, be happening. Uh, will, we will automatically reach that equilibrium. Since then, many Nobel Prize winners and economic thinkers have shown that some of these ideal conditions don't always exist. This is, I think, especially important in an environment like Kazakhstan, a country where we are considering to privatize uh, our economy to a very large extent. And so many questions uh, need to be answers for, answered. For example, which companies are ready for privatization and which ones are not? Or should all companies be privatized? Are there any public goods, for example, where privatization would lead to unexpected negative effects and I'm sure many, many more questions that are on your mind. So, without further delay, please welcome our distinguished guest, Mr. Kairat Kalimbedo. Welcome. Thank you very much uh, for these great opportunities to talk uh, to the future graduates of Nazarbayev University. I'm sure here is not only a uh, business school, uh, also public policy school. How many from public policy school? Great. <laughs> Uh, usually, uh, the public and business doesn't like each other, but, uh, but uh, let's talk about uh, public policy. And uh, thank you, uh, Patrick, who already mentioned. So today I would like uh, to talk about the visible hand of the markets and what's the role of the government uh, in broader terms, uh, including central bank and the uh, role of the state in all these economic processes. So. Uh, I want you to anytime interrupt me if you have a particular question, so I wouldn't like to borrow you with even this hour, and I think it should be a very interactive uh, session. So we mostly uh, will talk about three main dimensions of the public uh, policy, pub economic policy in Kazakhstan, which is uh, fiscal policy, monetary policy, and uh, structural reforms. So let's start from the uh, Classics. So, how many of you could explain what we are talking about on this screen? GDP. Uh, so, can someone brave talk more about the role of public spending or how to influence to the private investments and consumptions? Please. M microphone. Or government spending increases GDP. Okay, fine. And uh, but at the same time, more public spending uh, will uh, replace the efficient uh, private uh, investment. And uh, sometimes uh, it's a big discussion: uh, it should be more role of the government in the economy, or should be less uh, role of the government in the economy? So. Uh, what do you think in, in this public, uh, in this auditorium, what is, a, is a good sign of a more bigger government in the economy or not so good? So who, who should be? Fantastic, we will, we will come back, brilliant response. Uh, so 
let's uh, we will talk today about uh, the, the role in, in public spending and how the different tools of uh, p uh, public policy will influence on this on, on very concrete examples in the Kazakhstan economic policy. So uh, the second, uh, let's say, angle how to see to the economic policy is the traditional models of the financial programming. So how many of you knows the financial programming models? Uh, okay, so, uh, so I, I wish you to study it very carefully if you want to work in the Ministry of Finance or Central Bank or, or in the future in the International Monetary Fund. This is kind of the Bible to them to work on this. But uh, you could see here, uh, so here is kind of the models system. Uh, this model is uh, kind of double checking the, the previous model and here we will talk about the CPI, we will talk about the GDP, how to measure it by three methods. Uh, we will talk about the balance of payment, definitely government model, a model of the, uh, uh, monetary policy. Uh, so uh, we already start to talk about that uh, if, uh, uh, if we gov in, a, in times of crisis, uh, we, many governments using the famous uh, fiscal stimulus, or oh, let's back to the, the other famous uh, British economist, uh, Lord Keynes, who actually bring the Keynesian theory or Neo-Keynesian theory, which is, uh, by the way, this, I think these two books uh, Adam Smith and, uh, and uh, Keynes, it should be really Bible for the people who want to, let's say, devote their own life to the service to the, uh, to the uh, government. And uh, uh, what we've seen uh, during the crisis in 2008 and 2010, many governments uh, used the uh, fiscal stimulus. We remember it was a crisis in Eurozone, uh, where the many governments uh, will have a uh, had uh, many uh, so-called uh, uh, bailout in prog uh, bailout in approaches when they really inject significant amount of money to save the banking sector. We've seen like a Chinese government uh, invest uh, to the infrastructure in order to replace, uh, let's say, the previous uh, uh, inv investment uh, which was uh, in a in a period where it was a really high growth in China. We've, we've seen it in in. Kazakhstan. If you remember 2007-2010, uh, so the crisis in Kazakhstan started a little bit earlier, even before Lehman Brothers collapse, it was uh, quite uh, kind of the uh, huge challenge to the uh, economic model those time uh, because of the uh, two significant factors. So uh, you remember in 2004, in 2007, in Kazakhstan it was the processes of overheating of the economy. This overheating of the economy uh, actually allows to many banks actually uh, to take, to borrow some money from the external markets. It was significant amount of borrowing, about 45 billion US dollars. And uh, they invest this uh, very short term money to very long term uh, projects, uh, especially, uh, you know, that mostly to the real estate. Uh, and uh, what was uh, at the end, you remember, two out of four systemic banks were in pre-bankruptcy situation. Yeah, I'm talking about the BTA in Alliance. And then the government uh, intervened through, uh, and government and central bank and uh, sovereign law fund, Samruk Kazana, intervened in order to save those banks. First time, uh, first time uh, the president made a decision to use the money of the national fund. Uh, so I also would like just to ask you, who knows what is national fund? Is it organization or its account or its sovereign or fund? Who could, could explain it? I think it's all, uh, please. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, absolutely. So uh, the idea to create a national fund, uh, just to remind you, was born in 2001. Uh, it was the first money from the oil sector, which came from the crisis time. We, you remember it was a crisis, uh, Asian financial crisis and, Ru and the Russian uh, financial crisis. And after this, we uh, first time when the oil prices started going uh, up. And by the way, those time probably was oil prices was less than twenty dollars per barrel. And it was okay. I mean, everything was okay in Kazakhstan those time. I'm sure you remember this time and. Uh, uh, and then it was a different formula. So first of all, 
it's we call it national fund. It's uh, by nature the sovereign wealth fund. Uh, with, uh, the current formula is very simple. All taxes from the oil and gas sector are going to the not to the budget, but to the national fund. National fund is a not yet organization. Even we have a national investment corporation. If you have some questions, I will later on explain you what is it. Uh, but it's account of Ministry of Finance. Account of Ministry of Finance managed by uh, National Bank of Kazakhstan. So uh, the first money which came from the first privatization was $600 million. Right now we have $63 billion over there which is, I think, the fund of the future generation. By the way, one of the purposes of this, just to save money for more efficient Kazakh people, for young generation like yours, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that you will manage it much better than uh, in the previous generation. So this money was used in 2004. The size of the res uh, reserves of the central bank was about $20 billion. The size of reserves of the uh, national fund uh, was uh, 23 billion dollars. So uh, all together less than 50 billion. Inspire, even taking this into consideration, is not a small amount. Right now we are more close to the 90 billion dollars or sometimes to the 100 billion dollars. This money was used. 10 billion dollars was used. Uh, and here was the question. Uh, was it used, uh, uh, had it used efficiently or not? And we will talk later on about this. The second uh, stimulus package was being in uh, in uh, uh, actually uh, the performance, economic performance, uh, which was influenced by this uh, injection, was uh, not so bad. I mean, you remember after the 2010 and 11, the economic growth uh, back from the three percentage up to the seven percentage. So two years we have a, a seven and seven percentage, and in in, uh, in average 2008 and 2014, uh, all to, uh, the average economic growth was. 4.8 percentage, which is not bad, I think, for the uh, emerging markets. So, uh, so back to the fiscal stimulus. So, in in, uh, in a crisis time, the government can use it. In a, a normal time, it's better to put money to some sovereign wealth fund and just to save them for the future generation. And one of the reasons why we actually using the national fund is uh, also try to avoid so-called touch disease or oil curves. And you know, I'm sure that you study much this topic. So uh, now it's a uh, maybe more complicated formula, but, uh, but this is all about efficiency. So assume that we uh, will bring uh, additional public spend. And uh, how we will calculate, uh, did we use this money efficient or not? So here is the net, net benefit of this. And uh, uh, assume that G is the increase in public spend. And here you see a formula. So from one side, we have a valuation of each tenge which spent from the budget. From the other side, we have a, uh, also the, uh, let's say, the share of the uh, previously unused labor resources and the value of these so-called idle uh, resources. And the common formula is actually, and here we have a dead waste loss from the additional taxation. So we, if we will exclude G, so then we will see this kind of, from, from the first point of view, complicated formula, but I think it's not so complicated. So uh, let's, uh, let's come back to the Kazakhstani case. Uh, in the Kazakhstani case, it wasn't additional taxation in 2010 and 2008, 2010. We just used the money of the national fund. The second is uh, F, or unused labor forces, shouldn't be used uh, dramatically, and especially in... Uh, in a rural area, uh, when it was, uh, you remember, it was 2009 also, the uh, devaluation of the national currency, it means that the, the, the role of this factor wasn't, wasn't big. Uh, and uh, E, its efficiency must be increased. So come back uh, to this formula. So the most important issues. So how to really to think about uh, efficiency. And efficiency is... Uh, about the structural reforms, and we will talk later on about this. So how to do the budget program, uh, the, let's say, whatever government program, uh, really more efficient. Uh, so this is, uh, let's say, for the beginning of, in, uh, in terms of the fiscal policy. So let's move to the another tools, which was done on, on the first, uh, on the first uh, slides, uh, is the monetary tools. 
So many of the tools, uh, so we will talk today about the two uh, uh, significant decisions in the monetary policy which was recently uh, done. Uh, you remember the uh, so, uh, devaluation in 2009 and 2014 and, uh, devalua and the moving to inflation targeting in 2015. So uh, who would like to explain what's the difference between the devaluations in 2009 and 14 and the inflation targeting regime, which we now uh, recently moved in August last year? Is there any volunteer? If not, let me continue. So, <laughs> uh, the difference is the following. So we pre in previous reality of the monetary policy, we lived in, in a time of uh, so-called fixed exchange rate. So you know, we, uh, in the monetary policy in Kazakhstan, the, the most significant tool for the monetary policy in previous period was, uh, exchange, uh, was exchange rate policy. And in Kazakhstan, it was fixed exchange rate. It's a huge academic uh, uh, list of researches which is the policy is better to which particular country. Uh, sometimes it was very popular when it was fixed exchange rate. Later on, after the crisis in Latin America, especially in Argentina, was the, uh, let's say, the co common perception that uh, flexible exchange rate to allow countries to upshock external shocks. And uh, there is a distinguished community or list of the countries who already move to uh, inflation targeting regime. But uh, I'm not trying to simplify that inflation targeting is just the flex, uh, fixed uh, exchange rate. It's much more broader policy which allow really to focus on the concrete macroeconomic agenda. Uh, in case of the inflation targeting, from, from the name, you could just understand that this is about to target certain type, uh, certain uh, uh, size of inflation, which is very important for the, uh, the other economic policy to target the rates of the credits, rates of deposits, and many, many others. So uh, the, the difference was the following. So when, uh, what, how it worked in Kazakhstan? Just let me remind you in a previous period of time. So uh, in, a, in, a time, in a good time, let's say, when the price uh, of oil uh, is increasing or stable, uh, the fixed exchange rate uh, allow not to strengthen uh, local currency. So it means uh, um, the, it's allowed to be on certain level of competitiveness, but if the oil prices will start to decrease or it will be some volatility, so definitely volatility in, in the uh, depreciation uh, the, uh, direction, then it will be very difficult uh, to, to, change, uh, to change the current uh, exchange rate, particular exchange rate. So what happened when it was like uh, the, uh, the time when the uh, biggest decline in oil prices, you remember it, 2000, Eight and 2009 is also what happened in the, uh, the second uh, half of the year and then it dropped from 120 uh, till, uh, till 30, 36 or something like this. So what to do if you have a fixed exchange rate uh, and you don't know what will be the, let's say, the bottom of this uh, following of the uh, uh, oil prices. So usually it was like well, step devaluation one-time uh, devaluation. You just try to figure out that it should be some overshoot, so in order then the market should like percept, okay, this is more fair price for the local currencies, and then the people, let's say, wait the, the next devaluation. Uh, let's say the second devaluation happened uh, uh, after 10 years, after first devaluation. The, uh, the third devaluation happened after five years of the devaluation, and this is really not create a uh, kind of a uh, consistent policy or real uh, trust and good communication between people and uh, between, uh, uh, between market and the regulation authorities. So, uh, so let's say it was a previous reality. One was like 15 years of very good time uh, in Kazakhstan. And even this, it was not, not like a good policy which allowed to, uh, to develop a predictable, uh, predictable economic condition for the, uh, for the business. And uh, it was a, a common opinion in Kazakhstan, in the government, and in the central bank. We should move to more flexible exchange rate. And uh, so you know that in 2014, in, in uh, February, it was like an attempt to do the last time the step devaluation and then to move 
through the expanding of the band and uh, to be really uh, flexible exchange rate. But at the same time, you remember what happened in 2014 and 2015. <clears throat> in 2014 was a huge drop of the oil prices starting in October, November again. So uh, it was from $115 per barrel up to the, uh, up to the 42 and then it was also the huge uh, devaluation in, in our neighboring countries, in Russia, when the Russian ruble actually also devalued from uh, 32 dollar, uh, ruble per dollar up to the 80 in some days. It was, again, uh, a huge uh, kind of temptation to do one more step devaluation, and uh, which would be, to my mind, completely destroy the uh, banking sector in, in Kazakhstan. It was, uh, uh, let's say, the decision to do really in these terms, in, in these circumstances, real structural reforms. Now to move, not to the system when the kind of the central bank is uh, trying to figure out which is a, a real effective exchange rate and where, what is the fair price for the local currency. But the market themselves should decide it. So how, how, how it is working, uh, uh, it's working in many other countries. And it was a decision in August 15, uh, in terms that we have to move to inflation targeting. Before it was like two years of preparation, very hard work of the staff of Central Bank and uh, together with uh, our colleagues from the uh, Swiss uh, National Bank, from the uh, National Bank of the Czech Republic, from the uh, International Monetary Fund and many, many other consultants and advisors help us to really to, to move to the new system. <coughs> And again, uh, here we, we've seen that uh, the advantages of the uh, fixed, uh, flexible exchange rate in front of the fixed exchange rate is much more to really to influence to the uh, macroeconomic uh, performance, first of all, the GDP, and the second uh, is uh, inflation. And especially in terms of inflation, we really will start to, uh, to get some tools which we really have, uh, can influence in order to really uh, understand how to manage the inflation processes or how to have a kind of policy which could allow us to achieve certain target or certain goal in the future. And in order to do it, it was like a four main dimension of uh, our work. So first of all, we have to be prepared with certain uh, more economic models. So in order to understand what what is our uh, prognostic model, so how are we going to achieve it, what is the key factors which is influenced to this, and I mentioned that we did a great job in terms of preparing these uh, models. Uh, number two is uh, really to start to test what kind of tools do we have in order to influence to the, um, <coughs> uh, to the, to the inflation or in order to really manage, uh, manage a, a, a market. Number three is the uh, uh, decision-making process. This is uh, completely different stuff, but it's very important. And number four is uh, communication strategy. So let me move to, uh, first of all, to the, maybe to the analysis and prognostic uh, stuff. So bef uh, I think uh, before uh, this work was started uh, with the uh, International Bank of Kazakhstan moving in terms of inflation targeting, we had uh, some models uh, which worked for the previous model with a fixed exchange rate. And this mostly about, uh, these models didn't really use for the decision-making process. It was used for analysis, for understanding what's going on, but not really um, uh, explain uh, sometimes what's going on. Just to give you some example. So the model which is kind of predict inflation with a fixed exchange rate, and is always inflation changed those time in 15 years, but what is still dependent, what is the real formula? So it was like not really worked well. The second problem of the, all of these people who are good in uh, economic models, uh, you have to understand that we, we don't have really data series, serious uh, numbers which allow us to kind of to have any kind of the econometric models. Just because we have uh, 20 years of some numbers, which is just 80, uh, 80 indicators uh, quarterly. And, uh, so the analysis was just an assessment of the, what's going on, but it wasn't really be part of the decision-making process. And this is very much important. When we, any decision uh, in, a, in, a, in real terms should be uh, 
executed, it should be very well prepared. It should be really double checked from for different models, for different calculations, for different uh, analysis. And this what we start to do uh, after the we start to prepare the moving to inflation targeting it was uh, big work done with especially with the Czech Central Bank, which helped us to build a new model, not based on a fixed exchange rate, but based on a uh, flexible exchange rate. And this is, was like a three rounds of the, so first of all, we try to uh, set up a targets for the uh, one year period. Then we really uh, start to build two models of the short term forecast for GDP in inflation. And, in a, and then we start to build the medium term forecast, which is based on the quarterly prognostic model built together with our colleagues from IMF. So what is good in this term? So these uh, short term and medium term models are helping to each other to be more and less close to the, uh, to the estimation of what's going on. So later on, I, I will uh, give some uh, interesting ideas of the professor of Danny Roderick, which is talking about models and you will see uh, so how, how, how it's close to, to the reality. So uh, what was our uh, actually uh, set? Uh, first of all, it was a, a bridge equation model for forecasting of GDP, dynamic uh, uh, forecast model of food and non-food CPI, uh, assessment of the equilibrium exchange rate based on oil price and parity. Uh, and production uh, gap assessment model. And like I mentioned, quarterly prognostic model. And this uh, give us kind of a broader picture how it looks like all these linkages. So you see that is, uh, we have a, a, like external factors, what's going on with oil price, what is the CPI in our main trade partners like uh, Russia, China, and uh, European Union, what is going on with the food uh, uh, production indexes, what is uh, the exchange rate vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, what is the uh, exchange rate linkages between our key trade partners. And from, from the other side, you see that uh, uh, was also two model was, uh, two, um, uh, model was uh, used, and we see here huge uh, linkages between, interconnected linkages between trade uh, and uh, between, uh, uh, between GDP and many, many others, which allow us to formulate uh, monetary, monetary rule. What is the kind of key questions um, now to many central banks? Uh, the question about the conventional monetary policy. So you, you're probably now reading many kind of news that the uh, Fed, uh, Central Bank of the United States, decided to increase the rate or to decrease the rate or postpone to increase the rate. And everybody is talking about is it conventional monetary policy or not? So conventional monetary policy means that there is a kind of a clear rule, which is, uh, let's say, if you, you know this rule, you can calculate yourself based on your assumption, and they say, okay, so you guys are doing the right job, or you are guys not, you are just trying to, to do something wrong, because according to your rule, it is not working. And this is a, a huge discussion now between what to do with the conventional monetary policy, uh, what to do for when the EU and Bank of uh, Japan actually move to the area where they have a negative, negative territory of the area of the uh, key, uh, key policy rate. And uh, in Kazakhstan, we, and it's always a question, you have to identify rule, you have to communicate this rule, and you have to uh, execute this rule. Uh, so uh, what, uh, you have to do what you say. This is the main important uh, rule of the monetary policy, and definitely the central banks with the with the 200 years uh, 200 years policy, like Bank of England or many uh, many other central banks, try to follow this. But it's very it's very important to have a right communication strategy to explain what's going on and why it it, uh, it happened. So come back to one a new formula, which is so. Let me stop in terms of monetary policy. We'll come back with some questions probably later on. But uh, let's talk about this formula. This is a famous Cobb Douglas formula, so about how to increase uh, the output. And this is about, if you see in the formula more, is uh, the role of the labor factor, the role of the financial capital, and the sum productivity coefficient. So the countries like Germany or Japan, so we probably more focus how to improve the productivity. 
productivity through different te new technologies for improving the skills of the people. So by the way, one of the ideas that in uh, our financial center, what we want to develop is to bring uh, many experts uh, to work and to create here world-class industry in uh, asset, global asset management. Why we are thinking that it will be good for Kazakhstan? Even we have a tax advantages and with, let's say the 50 years those company will not pay taxes like in many other financial centers, for example, Dubai and Singapore. Because we are thinking about uh, the transfer of knowledge, know-how, and uh, this is very important because the skills I think is the most important stuff which is we, when we are talking about structural reforms. And I think in Kazakhstan the current uh, economic performance is more because of the financial capital, because a huge uh, investment. Uh, Kazakhstan is a FDI-driven economy and like uh, last uh, uh, 25 years we brought like 200 billion dollars, but it was mostly was investment you know very well to the, to the commodities and right now we start to think about how to diversify our economy, so how to, to really create the good opportunities for the future business. So let me, uh, so let me now to conclude this uh, speech uh, by certain uh, commandments, which was done by Danny Rodrik. I'm sure you know that Danny Rodrik is a uh, pro uh, professor of uh, famous economist, uh, was a professor of Harvard University when uh, uh, I knew him first time. And he is actually mentioned about uh, very interesting stuff. It's actually, by the way, from his recent book, I recommend you to, to uh, start to, to read it. So I like this one, number two. We talked about before about model. It's a model, but not the model. So you can imagine how important is uh, the real assumptions. Or unrealistic assumptions are okay, and unrealistic critical assumptions are not okay. Uh, the old is almost always second best. So let's move to the, the, the next one. This actually was for the economist, and there is also for the non-economist uh, by Benny Roderick. And uh, I like this one, uh, the second one. Do not criticize the economist more uh, uh, because of its assumption. Ask how the results would change in certain problematic assumptions where not more realistic. So there are many... Uh, discussion about models is always about economic policy, about uh, many, many conclusions. But what we, first of all, have to think about is just the any economic policy should be based on very academic and scientific approach, fiscal policy, monetary policy, structural reforms, which allow to the certain economic model to develop the uh, country further. And I think that in Kazakhstan, we already achieve uh, very good results in terms of the uh, many governments program, which was, we couldn't talk about the president, presidential uh, kind of cyclical policy, Nurli Zhou, we can talk about the, the industrial uh, diversification policy. Definitely the most important probably is the education uh, sector policy. And we have here many achievements, uh, like a Boloshak program, like a creation of Nazarbayev University. And I think it's really kind of creating a critical mass of people who will develop this country further. And uh, we also uh, thinking about uh, how to, let's say, institutionalize the, the memory and how to improve the, uh, let's say, big data in terms of the economic policy in Kazakhstan. And I'm sure uh, this meeting a little bit uh, will, uh, will be, uh, let's say, would be one step from your side to the uh, real economic policy in Kazakhstan. So let me stop here. I think you have many other questions. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Kalimbedov. A very interesting uh, talk, which I think will generate a lot of thinking and uh, I'm sure a lot of questions as well. Uh, you talked a lot about government policy, uh, which is a very visible hand, I would say. Uh, uh, and we'll talk about many aspects of what you talked about, uh, government policy, monetary policy, fiscal policy. Um, I would open, like to open it up for questions. Before you uh, ask your question, would you please state your affiliation, either the school or the university you're affiliated with, 
or the media outlet you uh, represent. So I'd like to open it up for questions and we have microphones on either side. Some questions. I see a question right there and a question there. We go first to the left. Thank you. My name is Diana Petrohova. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Karimbe. Uh, my question, I'm graduating uh, from the public policy school this year. Uh, I used to work in the Ministry of Finance and Anti-Money Laundering Committee before. Uh, my question is regarding the uh, inflation target and then we were talking about. Have you uh, modeled the uh, asset inflation? Uh, hello, Mr. Kilimbetov. Thanks for your presentation. I'm from uh, 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 Laboratory, Astana. And I would like to ask a question about the banking system. You know that, for example, our banking system works on the ba uh, system called as Basel II. And I, I have a question about if we will go and apply for the system called Basel III. What is your overview to this kind of uh, Include of this system uh, because, for example, nowadays our banking system is quite uh, not in a good position rather than Russian banks and Russian, Russian banking system. Thanks. Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Nurlaim Jaksabayeva. I'm also a master in public policy. I have two questions, they're not actually related with each other. First question is yes, we now face the challenge in time. But nevertheless, we should think also about our future and about our sustainable development. When Kazakhstan will start to make all this analysis based on genuine savings and genuine wealth, uh, to consider not only GDP as the development indicator, but also genuine wealth. And second question is related to Astana Financial Center. Uh, in recent times, we know about the Panama Papers and all this scandal related to that. So. Uh, and we are starting the financial center here in Astana. So will it be important, the origin of the money uh, which will come to Astana Financial Center? Or it will not be uh, so highly prioritized that it should be only like uh, clean money or something like this? Will it be important or not? Thank you. Good morning. Член Союза юристов Казахстана, и мое научное исследование посвящено именно применению норм английского права в казахстанской правовой системе. И в связи с открытием, созданием МФЦ, вся моя научная исследовательская деятельность она получила другое новое направление. Мы очень плотно и тесно сотрудничаем с Институтом законодательства Министерства юстиции. На сегодняшний день у нас сложилась такая проблема, что мы не можем разграничить найти ограничители, где начинаются гражданские иски и как гражданские иски переходят в уголовные. Но мы пока работаем с Дубайским центром. Думаю, что коллеги из Дубая нам помогут в разрешении данного вопроса. И а, здесь уже вопрос у меня непосредственно по моей докторской диссертации. Я столкнулась с такой проблемой, что в праве справедливости Англии существует одна из многочисленных доктрин, которая называется доктрина clean hands, доктрина чистых рук, в соответствии с которой стороны, которые разрешают споры, а финансовые споры, обязаны доказать свою честность о том, что они выиграли в тендере без подкупа, без коррупции и без каких-либо бюрократических инструментов. Вчера я разговаривала с бывшим министром юстиции Джеком Стро в Великобритании. Он ответил, что до тех пор, пока Казахстан не поймет механизм реализации а, доктрин Англии, правовых доктрин Англии, вы не сможете полноценно реализовать эту систему на своей территории государства. И хотелось бы вас, как главу МФЦ, услышать ваше мнение, спросить, услышать ваше мнение по этому вопросу. Все-таки для стран СНГ все еще проблематично, будем смотреть прав правде в глаза, для нас все еще проблематично вопрос э, победы в тендере. Как быть нам, вот, когда в Лондоне разрешался спор между Абрамовичем и Березовским, Березовский проиграл э, о том, что судьи Англии сказали, что он вертелся как Юла, и тем самым он психологически доказал, что он победил в тендере не нечестным путем. Спасибо. So let me start probably from the questions related to the financial uh, center and uh, so we, I think we both questions were about uh, how open uh, should be the center and what is the kind of the 
uh, approach from the, let's say, authority of the uh, financial center uh, for the further development. So just to give you, to those of you who are not uh, really familiar with uh, this initiative, it was uh, a constitutional law uh, adopted in December uh, last year here in Kazakhstan by the President and Parliament, uh, the law uh, on AIAC, so this is uh, how we call the financial center. And AIAC is very much similar to the DAAC model, and uh, you mentioned about the uh, Dubai International Financial Center. So, uh, definitely it's always difficult to talk about rule of law when you just got independence 25 years ago and your previous uh, legislative system wasn't Anglo-Saxon or wasn't like a very similar to those who already proved the kind of efficiency in the previous method. And so it's, there is a joke that uh, there is no uh, about the rule of law. So the rule of law is a simple stuff, but uh, it's difficult on the first 500 years. So we are now just in the beginning of this process. Uh, but from the very beginning, we just realized, okay, what is the kind of key challenges to, to us uh, in terms of implementing the, the completely different legal system? Because our uh, Kazakh local system, based on the previous, let's say, uh, Soviet and Soviet based on the continental is completely different and completely different, uh, uh, let's say, legislation and different even attitude to the court's decision and, uh, and many kind of scheduled zone around this. So first of all, uh, I think you, you have to know that there is a, a, a program of the president having specific uh, steps and there is a huge reform of the Supreme Court in, in Kazakhstan. So this is not just to the idea to create kind of a platform for the fair decision in a small pieces of land and, and then the rest of the community have kind of without system. Yeah? So I think uh, the, the role of AFC to be center of excellence. And uh, in this terms, so back to your... So famous now, the Panama Papers question. I think uh, the, the two uh, interesting processes now we've seen globally. So one is uh, uh, techno uh, the global economy be uh, became more uh, technologically intensive. You probably heard about uh, so-called blockchain technology. So the blockchain technology is something which I think destroy any untransparency in, in, in the very nearest future. Because when you put whatever transaction in the blockchain, where is the kind of your property for the land or your intellectual property or a smart contracts or anything. So it's already, you, can, you cannot change it. It's not on paper. It's like in, in for, 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 for lifetime or for the forever in some particular databases. And you could not hack it from any places. So from one side, we have anyway transparency is coming through technology. From the other side, transparency is coming from the moral principles, which is mentioned about. The uh, Panama Papers shows that the countries should uh, pay attention to the, let's say, how, let's say, what is the origination of this money? Where is this money from? And whom they belong? And who is the final beneficiary, uh, beneficiary of them? And I think these are already done in all of these, uh, let's say, global, uh, agreements in terms of, you know, that up to the 2018, there is uh, uh, agreements that the, all of these uh, tax authorities will be exchange information in a cross-border, uh, in a cross-border uh, uh, agreements. By the way, uh, you uh, a little bit, uh, uh, let's say, blame the situation in post-Soviet Union countries, but let's back two years before. Let's take the Swiss private banking system. It was a big critics of them when the people actually because of the all of this hacking and everything there is huge leak of information it was database actually was uh, withdrawn from the many many private banks and then the many governments in the world ask why we let's say if you are particularly uh, citizen of particularly european countries why you are not paying taxes actually why you just put it in some particularly private banks and not paying taxes. And there are many kind of mis, uh, you know, um, discomfort with this. And I think that this agreement, which is kind of the now, uh, and Kazakhstan definitely will join to this agreement. And definitely the IFC would be part of this agreement. And there is no idea 
that we have something where we just just whisper and um, not and to, there is no any chance even to to be untransparent for AFC. So in these terms, uh, again, we the government is working to be and committed to join to all of the OECD principles of the transparency. The government is joining to the uh, uh, to the so-called money laundering initiative, which you know, called FAT. The government joining to the FATCA with also the providing all the information to the U.S. tax authorities. Uh, the government is now uh, the central bank and the IFC authority working to join to the IOSCA, so it's an international organization in terms of securities. So the later on, there is no any more bank ex uh, banking secrecy. There is no, uh, let's say, any privacy uh, anymore because of technologies, because of the, all of these moral principles and everything. And we don't have any kind of the idea to compete in a transparency. We are competing in transparency. So we want to, and by the way, it will be regulation authority, which would be uh, separate from central bank, but it will be based on the principles of IOSCA. And the idea is actually to bring all the money. By the way, to bring money from the, the wealth of the people in Kazakhstan, people in Central Asia, people in Russia, people in China, but if they will see comfortable, let's say, in a particularly ecosystem which we will build in, in AFC, I think it will be a great idea. Coming back to the particularly, so how it is these two systems will work. Uh, so uh, we call it like Hong Kong, you know, that uh, Hong Kong and China now one country, one country, two systems, yeah? So what we call also here, we are in Kazakhstan, we are part of Kazakhstan, but we have a kind of a small pieces of land, which, uh, by the way, 25 hectares, which is uh, next door to you is an expo site, and we are dreaming, by the way, to join Nazarbayev University Labs. So to us, I think it will be also a good idea. And uh, tax advantages and, and many others. And uh, for you and young people, for us, so what we, we are dreaming about. So how these two systems will work, uh, it's, a, it's a really uh, very uh, uh, serious question. It's a serious topic for academic research. And uh, we are now working with the top uh, seven uh, uh, lawyers company in London and now we, uh, the other seven from the US will sooner or later join to, to, to work with us in order to implement the English law. Because uh, it's a principle of common law. So how English law will work? How it will, will enforce, for example, the court of the AFC decided in some investment dispute that some side is uh, right and some side is wrong. Uh, what we, would be the reaction of Supreme Court of Kazakhstan to this? It's very much important. And I think, uh, so this is, which is, uh, we're now working with the AFC authority. They are helping us to build the in, uh, independent financial court with a close cooperation. In two, three years, we have to deliver it, this already. Definitely, from the, in the first time, it will work all the international judges. Judges who already worked in uh, British uh, legal jurisdictions like uh, in London, in Singapore, in Hong Kong. We, we have to bring them. We have to bring the regulation uh, regulators who work in the regulation authorities. We have to bring the people who work in the investment arbitrage. So this is, I think, the first 10 years more would be very close to, by the way, to the DAFC, where the all of these uh, people outside of the country came and helped to build this. Later on, I, I hope that those of people who would be lawyer in the future would be part of the system. You could be judge, you could be advisory, you could be a consultant, and uh, you could uh, work in the system. And uh, you mentioned about that uh, would be will join to those principles. I also talked this morning to Mr. Straw, who is a former uh, British foreign minister, and I think uh, he was really excited of the willingness and commitment of the country to deliver it. Because when we are talking about to bring FDI, so FDI is always coming when we understand uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, the game's rule. What is the country uh, about? What is the rules over there? And here I would like just to move to the, your questions about the sustainable development goals. So you know the Kazakhstan also committed to the Paris COP21 goals. And there is a strategy of the president which called called uh, long-term strategy up to 2050. We are committed actually to change our structure from the driven from commodities, especially hydrocarbons, move to the more uh, renewables and to, to build so-called uh, uh, green economy in Kazakhstan, but to understand the sustainable growth more in uh, several dimensions. So usually when the people about green 
and be sustainable, we are more talking about on the environment side, which is very important. But it's also the economic and social side, and especially the issues of the inequality. The growth should be sustainable but inclusive. And this is, uh, I think, that what is the government is very much working about through the different uh, labor department, from the, through the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Healthcare. I think we are on the right way on this. So let me move to the banking sector. And uh, I love your questions. It's my kind of favorite in my previous life. Uh, what to do with the banking system when I used to work a regulator uh, in this country uh, to the banking sector. Again, uh, if we will, uh, the two uh, main principles, which I would like ask you to a little bit think about, I'm, I don't know if you have some previous banking sector background, so there is always kind of a uh, lobbying opinion of the banking sector that, uh, so okay, everything is okay in our uh, house, so the role of the central bank or the government is just not to intervene and not to make us a business. Uh, it was quite popular among the banking sector before uh, Lehman Brothers collapse. That the most, uh, let's say, clear, uh, clever and intellectual people are working for investment banks. So it was like very popular, all the people, graduates of the business schools dream about the investment banks and uh, etc. What happened in, when it was Lehman Brothers collapse? So we, the first time the regulators realized that we are not regulating anything because they don't know what's going on with us. And why they don't know what's going on with us? Because we, we, there is a, let's say, they were close to the regulation authorities. And it was a huge bailout. Even the famous uh, American banks became the government owned for a temporary period of time. It was, a, let's say, really, uh, since those period of time, it's a huge mistrust to the banking community, in the Western community, let's say. In terms of the, and the, the, go, the government decided to Im, improve and to strengthen in the regulation. Because without any kind of regulation, so uh, it's not always good. So it should be kind of uh, this. And how to regulate it? There are certain principles, which is Basel Committee recommended. In the previous stage, it was a Basel II, now it's a Basel III. And our banks is always telling, oh, oh, okay, so Basel III is too early for us. It's, uh, in, in Russia, it's quite more, uh, let's say, light uh, regulation. Let's do more light like in Russia. We try to do more light regulation in 2004, in 2007. Uh, the end of the story was a disaster so when it was like a really pre-bankruptcy situation. We used the taxpayers' money, and now the government in the world decided we'll never provide taxpayers' money to, to save the banks because this is a private uh, story. And I think in these terms, uh, we have a, the upcoming technological progress. You see the, what's going on, and this kind of, I recently was in the United States, there are kind of two schools. Old school, which is a kind of the Wall Street, and the East Coast, and the West Coast, Silicon Valley. And they're always now in discussion, what was the future of the banking sector? The Silicon Valley is just trying to tell we don't see any banks in the future. The banks are telling that this is disruptive technologies, we've seen them many times, 5% of them survive, we don't, uh, no, we don't believe that you will really change. And there is a kind of a huge discussion now. But what is really change, I think? What is really change is really the uh, many banks now start to realize that they have to work not like a conservative previous uh, banking manner. They have to work like a Google, like IT company. They have to be very agile. They have to change any minute, to ready to be changed uh, uh, any minute. And I think this is kind of a good changes. And our banks should be, uh, let's say, ready for those type of competition rather than just to, to discuss with regulation authority what type of regulation do they need. And your question was about do we... Yes, we start to, to, to use also the this, uh, but it's on very early stage yet. Uh, Before we go to a few more questions, I'd like to ask you a, a few questions. Uh, first, some of the things you, you touch upon are, of course, not only a discussion and a challenge in any emerging market, but in any very mature market. You know, light versus heavy hand in regulation is very much still a discussion, as you indicated. Uh, in the US. Uh, one of the very important aspects I think you touched upon as well is uh, social sustainability. 
because we, of course, talk about how can we restructure, privatize the country, make our economy more market-oriented. But we have to do that, of course, in a way that we're not going to have a revolt on our hands or total chaos. And so thinking about that, of course, is a, is, is a big challenge. Yeah, I, I would like to come back to your questions when you mentioned about the, how to measure it, the economic success. So uh, I think uh, all of the current model of competitiveness or economic performance based on the driven by GDP. And uh, it was good for a certain moment of time because if you increase the GDP, you increase a certain job places, you could uh, share some of the prosperity through the distribution of the taxes. And many countries think like this. So, for example, even in China, so we, we each governor of a particular region have to deliver a certain GDP, certain investment. It was really kind of a good understanding of this. When we, all the countries realize that uh, uh, from the sustainable uh, development goals or before the millennium development goals point of view, it's not so sustainable. Because some countries use their resources and it can work 20, 30, 40 years, what to do next? I mean, and then when you use these resources, you can, let's say, get some economic performance, uh, social unrest, corruption, etc. We've seen in many Latin American countries, let's say, in the 60s, in the 70s. And uh, it was some new theory, uh, which called five capitals, now it's six, actually, which is including uh, uh, not only the financial capital in terms of GDP growth, but it's also the natural capital, uh, is also the manufacturing capital, human capital, social capital, and part of this is also the intellectual capital. And the idea is actually, we currently all this ranking on the competitive is more about only financial. So what is going on with macroeconomics? If you see, even the, in the World Economic Forum, so we call it a sustainable competitiveness report. But it's not really sustainable. It's more about the, what's going on with your macroeconomics, uh, what is your inflation, etc., uh, etc. Et not about really what is with the social inclusivity, what is the uh, Gini coefficient, so what to do with this, and how sustainable your current growth. And I think so, maybe in the future some researchers will devote their PhDs to, so how to develop all five capitals simultaneously, or how to develop uh, one of them but not to damage the other one. It's really a very interesting issue. Very interesting, very difficult as well, of course. As uh, an economist once told me, uh, we're really very good at predicting the past, but not so good the future. So uh, it is very complex to take all the factors into account. I think we're ready for a few more questions now. Please introduce yourself and ask your question. Um, good evening. Thank you for your talk. My name is Sultanat. I'm from Graduate School of Public Policy, second year student. Um, <clears throat> actually, there is a notion that Kazakhstan is very good at planning, but um, performing bad in implementation and especially in communicating the policies. For example, after the numerous devaluation and other economic shocks, there was a high increase of no, um, concerns among the ordinary citizens within the social media. And my question is, um, how do you think how we can increase the trust of public uh, on their government? Thank you. My name is Nurjan Tantaev. I'm from GSPP school and currently doing my master in public policy. And I have a question from the perspective of uh, public financial management. So currently we are, witness, we are witnessing that uh, Kazakhstan is facing huge fiscal challenges. So the, currently, the non-oil fiscal uh, balance of Kazakhstan is negative, and the, the overall fiscal balance is going downward, according to the IMF forecast. So how Kazakhstan should deal with the fiscal consolidation? Azumat Kaldebekov, uh, I am a guest to business school. Uh, my question is regarding uh, the effectiveness of managing the wealth fund, uh, national fund, uh, you mentioned earlier. And what is your per personal opinion about the article of Mr. Uh, Uti Murat, uh, which was published in Wall Street Journal uh, regarding the poor uh, management of national uh, fund at this moment, uh, giving it to just uh, JP Morgan, which gives a rate of one or one and a half percent. 
uh, or either give to its you know, national investment corporation, which is young and uh, at this level is not uh, so advanced to manage that kind of money. Uh, so let me start from your uh, questions, which was uh, my favorite one in uh, the, the, the last year when I worked in, in, in a central bank. Uh, so first of all, what I would like to say is that nobody is perfect. I mean, including all, like you mentioned, e execution among Kazakh people. Uh, but I think that is kind of a stereotype that the Kazakh people c cannot deliver it the, the, wherever they're planning very well. Uh, because it's kind of controversial. Or they're planning not so well, or they, let's say, they ex deliver it something else. Yeah? And uh, so here is everything about institution. The 25 years is difficult to tell that uh, we will already build the kind of the world-class institution and everything. There are maybe a number of uh, uh, institutions which we can consider like a world-class, but the rest is kind of on the way to be in a world-class. So one of them is World uh, National Fund, I will later on to come back to the Azamat's questions in terms of how to manage the, the National Fund. But you are right, it was many mistaken in communication policy. And uh, especially, I think, the, in Kazakhstan, like in many other countries, the context of the social media is underestimated. So the people, like in, in social media in Kazakhstan, sometimes it's a kind of the new generation perception, which is they wouldn't like to discuss any public disputes, but they are very much free to deliver it it's through different smiles on, or as a kind of the uh, statements. And uh, so I think that uh, in the future, or even right now, or even yesterday, we have to, 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 to know how to, to work with this. Yeah. I can tell you that uh, uh, this is also the skills. Uh, let's say you could see, uh, you can have any kind of the uh, own perception of what's going on, for example, in Russia or in China, but if you see the social media, they always agree with the government policy. And here is kind of, it's not a matter of if it was a fair or efficient or uh, right decision. It's a matter of how these uh, services are working. And I think here is a central bank itself, first of all, the other government agencies. Uh, we, all, all of us, we have to consider this like a, uh, like a common uh, platform. This is our country. We have to be responsible for this, I mean, for the opinion. I remember there was many issues when there was many rumors and many kind of the... Uh, provocation for rumors it was uh, but uh, I think it was like a many lessons which we conclude it's a real case study how how to how to uh, manage communication and I think we, we are on the way what to do and uh, uh, I think but in a broader terms the social media play in a really crucial role in terms of the previous question in terms of the transparency and I think that right now you've seen that uh, whatever is going on through the social media we immediately know about and your generation or so-called the millennium generation are not want to even to go to the branch of the banks or to read the hard uh, copies of newspapers. We are, we are all in, uh, in a uh, web uh, space. And uh, I, I agree, this is a future, by the way. This is a good future and uh, hope that uh, we will manage this a better way. Uh, back to the questions of the National Fund. Uh, which was, uh, so let me start uh, from the, uh, it was a big discussion again in social media, what, what Beric said, what Beric mean, what Beric uh, uh, decided, etc. I think it was like a ex little bit exaggerated because it was like a management change uh, in the NIC. And uh, I, I talked to Beric and he was saying that some statement was misinterpreted uh, in terms of this. Uh, and again, it's kind of a responsibility for the here is the two aspects. I think the one is the most important, is the responsibility of any government employee, with, when even former employee. When you are telling something to the media, it's kind of the, so uh, what is the kind of, uh, should be behind? I and mean, then there is a responsibility for the people who you are invited to a certain office, and then this, those people also would be asking why you are kind of, what's wrong with, uh, what you did execute when you are in office. And I think for the team of uh, Beric, it was a great opportunity in two years to build world-class 
uh, let's say, this small sovereign wealth fund, which can really, yeah, they brought very talented young people from the different, uh, uh, different uh, of, uh, companies. It's really great teams. Part of them uh, now are working in uh, AAFC. And I'm proud that we actually educate those people. And it was really open procedures how to hire people, was open HR policy, open uh, uh, everything was in really world class. And we've got all of this uh, admirers from the many private equity and global private equity and hedge funds and people like uh, Ray Dalio, Steve Schwarzman. We're really very much excited when the people in Kazakhstan could think this way, how they, they, these people think in NIAC. The uh, content point of this is like, uh, it was like a maybe call to think about the, uh, the future of the National Fund. Just to be fair, we're already two years working with a number of the global investment banks and, uh, and the hedge funds and the certain consultants in terms of how to improve the efficiency of National Fund. The current formula of National Fund consists from two sides. So one is that it's a Norwegian model where all these uh, taxes from oil and gas go into the fund and they invest it outside. This type of Norwegian model is very good. The second type, how to manage it outside. The Norwegians are managing it themselves because they already have a 40 years experience. But uh, they decided for themselves to do one important stuff. So you know the markets are always volatile. And we have now certain uh, very conservative formula. 80% of this money invests to the fixed income. It means that there is no really huge upside and probably it, is, it will not be a really huge downside. And if you want to earn money, you always have to expect downside. So it's like a four years upside, one year downside. Four years upside, one year downside. And to get this downside, they took the Norwegians uh, like uh, many years to convince government and parliament that they have to explain to Norwegian people the downside is not bad because in the future we will see the upsides. And there are, we have to kind of reverse this formula. We are working under this now. I think it is coming. So there would be many discussions, different opinions, and we have to decide to ourselves. Be conservative for the government employees is always a more safe position to be conservative. But I think if think about 20 years horizon, we have to be more efficient. And this efficiency in terms of the change in the formula Beric did a lot in, to involve to this, not only him, many people work, and I think that there will be kind of also room for the future work of these people in the uh, development of the National Fund. Back to the fiscal policy, you were absolutely right that uh, in a good time the non-fiscal deficit means that the all revenues minus, uh, non-oil revenues minus expenditures uh, wasn't more than 5-6% of GDP, negative. It was like always the model when we uh, have a kind of a budget uh, deficit around 1 or 2 percent. Not like in Singapore, so the non-deficit formula is always with some small deficit. But 5, 6 percent is, is okay. Now, right now it's increasing little. It's, low, it's already double G probably. And so the idea how to manage it, we manage it again two ways. One way to earn much more money than we could earn from the national fund. So this is obvious, we did a calculation. Well, what could be done if it previous 20 years use the Norwegian formula. And, and the second way is really to decrease the withdrawn transfer from the national fund. And uh, I'm very optimistic about formula of, uh, was some pessimistic approach that the national fund could be eaten and it's over and now it's end of the end. It's not like this. It was very, radical assumptions, and many, many other stuff. So what I think is that we have to think of two dimensions. One is how to better manage the national fund in terms of the investment declaration and policy. And the second is really to create non-oil economy, which will bring new revenues. And, and to, to have really uh, very prudent uh, fiscal policy. This is kind of quality of our uh, work in terms of the budget planning, budget execution. And I think we learn a lot for the last two, three years, and we are in good shape now, much better than it was in previous period. Before we go to a few more questions, um, again, I have some questions. Do you see that the Astana International Financial Center will play an important role in attracting more talent that will actually help to better manage the fund and 
be more efficient about it. Uh, that is, I think, one of the things we hope to accomplish that will attract a lot more financial talent. Uh, but often we talk a lot often about, you know, what is the perception? How do people understand it? Uh, how do we, well do we communicate? In terms of the uh, International Financial Center, um, we know what the impact will be on the financial sector. We know some of the challenges. In the best possible case, what would be the promise of a successful International Financial Center for the business community, individual companies, and yes, maybe even individual people? Thank you. Uh, here I would like just uh, to remind you fee, uh, five key pillars which we want to develop in financial center. So first is the capital markets development. And it was very much uh, developed. You know that the liquidity is, uh, uh, let's say, flows is very, is very low in Kazakhstan. And the CASE in Almaty is more about the currency exchange rather than real transaction in capital uh, markets. Number two is asset management. So your question is more about how to create world-class uh, uh, asset management industry in Kazakhstan. So what to do, how we, how we could really invite people uh, to... The favorite question is, uh, which global uh, asset managers will come to Astana when in January here will be minus 45? So what's, what's uh, really attractive here? And uh, so the opposite question, so what's attractive uh, in uh, GCC countries when we apply plus 45 over there? And they also are now... You know that Saudi are building big financial district. They really they recently declared it. The Abu Dhabi is working on this with a huge sovereign wealth fund. Dubai already uh, exists like 15 years and very much succeed. Uh, I think uh, one of the ideas, by the way, is uh, we already start to talk to those people, to the big uh, global ma asset managers, who said, okay, why don't we will not to talk about kind of the uh, very... Uh, uh, let's say, uh, controversial dilemma sticks and carrots, but let's talk about in the business terms. In the business terms is following. We have a uh, 60 billion now, we have a 30, uh, 30 billion in the reserves of central bank, we have a pension savings of the people of Kazakhstan. So all together, more than 100 billion dollars, which should be managed by the, our partners. And the previous model of the management was like, uh, okay, give us money, uh, sign the contracts, uh, we will come in three years, we'll explain you why it was like it's so bad performance and uh, you could send your people for secondments, but it was more like a touristic destination rather than real work and real understanding of the business process. So right now what we want is really start to transfer this technology just to say, why don't we guys will sit together and we discuss particularly size of the investment, particularly, uh, uh, let's say, in terms of your, how, what is the time horizon to manage this money? What's your program? How do you localize some of your activity here in the IFC? And how to, uh, let's say, how you bring some technologies, how you educate the, our people to be in the same level of how to manage the global assets uh, with you. So this is something around this. It was uh, already succeeding in Singapore 30 years ago. It's now succeeding in Dubai, which they started like 10 years ago. I'm sure that we could deliver it as, uh, as well in, in Kazakhstan. But again, uh, the current using of the national fund is not so efficient in terms of the teaching our people how to manage money. If we will create here in Kazakhstan the world-class industry, how to manage the global assets, I think it will be really great inputs to the further development uh, of the financial sector here, great inputs to the future capital markets development we're thinking about, by the way, also a fintech and Islamic financing. So these are kind of the new areas, which is completely new. It's not developed yet in, uh, in Kazakhstan, but uh, I, they are very promising. So this is not just plan. This is kind of the roadmap. And uh, we are together with our partners are very keen in the uh, first 10 years to deliver it kind of the first performance, which is in aggregate terms, if you ask me, is kind of to be in top 10 uh, Asian financial centers in the world, which is very ambitious, of course. Yeah. And, and we, we, by the way, very much subscribe to that ambition here. We very much at Nazarbayev University, both at the schools of public policy 
the economics department uh, at the School of Humanities, and of course the business school, very much subscribe to helping you do that. Before questions, uh, can I also a uh, little bit add about the, uh, which is my favorite topic now, in terms of the fintech development. I'm sure that you are following all of this latest edition of news, uh, what's going on with uh, all of these wallets, what's going on with Alibaba, Amazon, or, and uh, we recently were in London, and there is a place on, in, a, in a canary wars which is called Level 39. I, I recommend strongly to visit this place. For you, we have a direct flight from Astana, by the way. And uh, uh, so what is the idea over there? They try to bring, I mentioned about this discussion West and East Coast before in the US, they try to bring it together. And there are many talented young students, PhD students, master's students, who are having many ideas. So usually people uh, create the ideas when they're young, like you. And, uh, but uh, usually it's not financed, or usually nobody believes to those ideas, or there is no kind of the protection of lawyers, or there is no certain uh, colleagues who will help you to develop your IT products or to your business idea. So they create this financial acceleration uh, uh, entity over there, and this is very much developed, by the way. And what we want to do jointly, we've met with uh, Mr. Shigeo Katsu and also discussed it, to have some joint venture in terms of the AAC and uh, Nazarbayev University. And very soon the people from this, uh, who creates uh, Level 39, they will come in Astana Economic Forum. Uh, it's people from Innovate, British Innovate Finance Organization. And they also want, what we, the first question of them, well, we need access to the students. And this is very high-ranking people in the British government, and they said we need access to those students who can manage this particular business and who will create startups and many others. And you see that many people in Russia and Belarus are very much, uh, uh, let's say, uh, are very much uh, successful on these terms. And we consider it Nazarbayev University, like uh, if we are, let's say, Silicon Valley of Kazakhstan. So we, we, you are Stanford University, so we have to be very productive in this. Or the University of Chicago, I hope. My hometown. Yeah, we, <laughs> you know <laughs> no, Stanford I, University. I, I, I love the University of Chicago, like example, where it's no, also not the best climate in the U.S., but it's a great financial center. Yeah, and so it's great to try and convince people from there. They're already used to the cold weather. <laughs> Would you expect in the future, with all that's happening at the International Financial Center, that we will see more participation from private citizens in capital markets? Yes, uh, so here we have, uh, I think, two aspects. What we learn and a key takeaway from the uh, different uh, negative experience, so you probably know this, uh, 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 let's say, what happened in the Shanghai or Shenzhen Stock Exchange, and this sell-off was like a reaction that the structure of the, uh, let's say, of all of these uh, participants in this market was this balance because it was more retail investors rather than institutional and now the Chinese government working how to fix it. Uh, because it was very developed culture to invest uh, from retails, from the normal, uh, normal people to the different, they even take the credits to invest to the kind of the, this uh, bubble. Uh, it was, let's say, uh, one extreme. The other extreme we have in Kazakhstan, so nobody wants to invest. So whatever stock exchange now. And here we, I think with Nazarbayev University also, have to deliver it online programs and really to create kind of generation of people who will manage their money. We have it for wealthy people here. And I think we, uh, let's say through the IPO of, IPOs of our uh, sovereign world fund companies or many different, uh, let's say, the opportunities to, be, uh, to buy out the government bonds or the corporate bonds, we, we, will, uh, we won't really to develop this area. Otherwise, it will be difficult to develop financial centers. Very exciting. Do we have time for maybe one more round of questions? All right, and uh, where are, there's one on the side there, or two maybe. Um, first of all, I want to thank you. Mr. Kambet, it, it is a pleasure to listen for your lecture. Uh, my name is Akubek. I am from NURIS, Nazarbayev University Research and Innovation System. Work as a manager of business incubator. I have a general question about all our economy and the approach of government. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what should do government 
during the crisis, should governments uh, develop new industries or support traditional ones? Because there will be big problem if new industries do not generate taxes revenues, and the traditional ones didn't get support, and they also do not generate enough taxes. What are your personal opinion about this? Good evening. My name is Azamat Askerov. I am a master student of public policy school. And my question is as follows. In terms of inflation targeting approach, which is being used by a national bank now, how important it is to have independent national bank? And to what extent uh, the national bank is independent now, in, in your opinion? Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for the speech. Um, the topic of the... Please, please introduce yourself. Student of Foundation student, and uh, the topic subject of Atlanta International Finance Tech, uh, Center is in the spotlight. And uh, all great leaders they foresee the future. As a governor of uh, Asana Finance Center, what do you expect? Uh, what is your anticipation? In other words, how do you see Asana Finance International Center in five or ten years? Thank you very much. So, maybe let me start from the innovation side. Uh, the government is already uh, kind of delivered own opinion on this and I'm sharing this I'm on the same page with uh, what the different government uh, entities are doing. Uh, so what is it? Is it first of all, uh, I think, uh, so it's kind of two institutional, uh, three institutional level. One level, like you mentioned, there is a traditional sector of the economy of Kazakhstan. Actually, who are make money for Kazakhstan? Oil and gas, uranium, mining, agriculture sector, certain type of agriculture sector. And I think what is uh, good in these terms, so we have to uh, do two stuff. One is just really to help those uh, subsectors, if when it, also some difficult times to them. For example, it was like a slowdown in China, it was uh, affected to the mining and to the, uh, let's say, to, to the uh, oil sector as well. I think uh, the government is always have to have, by the way, the oil sector, it's the most innovative uh, sector globally. So many innovation in the oil sector. So we are just thinking that it's something which is so routine, is not like this. So many innovations have to be done in uh, this traditional, already working sector, which is already competitive advantage of Kazakhstan. Uh, but, but we have to use it to move to the kind of the uh, further direction. So one of the ideas is very classical. So we have the oil, Let's develop petrochemical or some kind of service industry to the oil sector, like the people deep in Aberdeen, like the people deep in Stavanger, in Houston, and many other areas. Uh, if we have a mining, why don't we will develop some metallurgy? If you have agriculture, why don't we develop food processing? Taking in, into consideration that the Chinese uh, middle class in the future will be 300 mi uh, million people which wants to eat the uh, very uh, good quality food. And uh, I think uh, having this large geography and bringing some best technologies, which is also area for innovation here in Kazakhstan, is also great opportunities. So this is wave number two. And wave number three is a completely new from scratch the industries, which we have to create. I don't know, it will be FinTech or Biotech. It will depend from you guys what we really could uh, create here. But the role of the government to create uh, through incubation system, through, uh, through supporting of startups, through the uh, education system to really support to this. I think government start to do it. It's uh, it's on the way, and uh, there is no other chances to survive if you will not do all three. Uh, back to the independence of central bank. Uh, so when we move to inflation targeting, there is a certain global rules. What is inflation targeting? Definitely it's sometimes different, but in, in main issues are uh, very important, which I tried to explain you that uh, uh, based on the models which was delivered uh, uh, during the preparation to inflation targeting. The entire idea is just to convince to the people uh, that the policy which is done, monetary policy, is not from the clouds, so once uh, I wake up and decided to do this on this. This is a calculation, this is a reality, this is a forecast prognosis, this is a discussion. And by the way, uh, look at the, how the discussion is done in Fed, how we develop the discussion in Fed, in, uh, or in the Bank of England. So the people are, first of all, uh, publishing what is the agenda, and uh, what is the main statement of this agenda? 
and how the different members of the board actually vote for this. And it's really real transparency and real independence. Nobody could, let's say, influence to those people to make certain decisions. Here there is a kind of the uh, conflict of interest between, for example, Treasury and Central Bank, and sometimes it's a tough discussion, but nobody should call to each other just to say, you know that according to my budget needs, I have a certain idea. The Central Bank has own agenda. This is why the Central Bank was created starting from the Bank of England, it has to be independent, and this is kind of rule of uh, law and all this structure of the future government in, in Kazakhstan and current uh, uh, reality should be that we should, based on the best practice and best practice, the central bank uh, should be independent. As in my practice, uh, in uh, I know all of the previous governors, uh, is, I mean, so in the future will be uh, future governors, the governors of central bank should be always independent and their voice of regulation authority should be very loud. And question number three was about... Uh, uh, the international financial system. Yes, uh, I think uh, what we expect in five, uh, ten years. Uh, we're expecting that we will be in top ten uh, in Asia. We're expecting that we can attract some money from the, not only Central Asia but also the Russia, Mongolia, uh, Azerbaijan, maybe Iran in the future expected that we will be significantly important part of the One Belt, One Belt. Uh, and so in these terms, I think the most important in, uh, investment is uh, preparation of the soft infrastructure, because physical infrastructure is already clear that it will be the uh, expo site. But the more important to invest into the right institution and to the right uh, and to the human uh, skills. And here is like, I think the global competition is not about the, how we are thinking about in terms of the, this morning we discuss what will be oil price and guess like this or like this. So this is really useless uh, guessing and discussion. What is uh, useful? Useful is now to just to forget the, about this factor and to say, okay, tomorrow we don't have any oil, like president is always saying. What we, how are we going to survive? Are we... Can we, 17 million people, make money for ourselves to do all of this healthcare, pension, education, military, uh, etc.? And this is really tough questions, and it all depends from ourselves. Here today is the responsibility of the, our generation. Uh, tomorrow, it will be uh, your responsibility, and you have to be well educated and more, uh, let's say, entrepreneurship. Uh, your spirit of entrepreneurship uh, should be much more uh, higher. We've seen it recently. It was in Finland, it was in Sweden, it was in Singapore. So many countries achieve a great result. I don't see any reason why Kazakhstan could repeat it. Couldn't repeat it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I moved here about a year and a half ago from Chicago, and I must say I have been nothing but astonished about the incredible human resource available here. So for me, the question is very clear. If 17 million Dutch people can do it, I'm sure 17 million Kazakh people can do it. Every day I'm reinforcing that again. And every time you're, of course, you're a friend of us, you're a friend of Kazakhstan, obviously. Uh, but when I, we have guests here that from outside Kazakhstan come here in this very room and in very similar forums and we go through similar questions, they often come to us afterwards and say, wow, you have incredible people here. The quality of the people is nothing but astonishing and could compete with any best academic institution in the world. You know, the people in Techno Park that I visited this afternoon, I listened to our students who always, I think, come with incredibly intelligent and well-informed questions. I am very sure that um, as I find the way from Chicago to Astana, you will very soon find a very frequent way from across the road in the International Financial Center to come work with us. Now that we are neighbors, I think uh, we will and hopefully work together very often. And I hope to be able to invite you sometime very soon again for another one of these talks. Thank you very much for your time.